Serena Gemistad with her green stone, a little thing called curiosity. Curiosity, the desire to know, the singular feeling that separates humans from most other living organisms on our earth. We humans are programmed with curiosity. By who? I'll let you decide that one. Each and every one of you in this crowd, from the day you were born, you had this eagerness to explore and discover things about the world around you. I'm sure you had a moment or two in your life where you had a question, something as simple as, why is the grass green to what is the meaning of life? Allow me to share one of my first wake up calls in life that has led me to be who I am today, standing here doing my green stone. It's 2008. I'm sitting in the living room with my father. I'm not sure if he remembers this story, but he was on his phone and I was just on the floor playing. And then I suddenly noticed a little voice in my head and I just thought to myself, wow, I'm in my own body. I'm me, this is Serenia, I am Serenia, but what is Serenia? And you know, in my simple seven-year-old brain, I was completely mind blown. I thought I was dying, it was such a surreal feeling. Looking back in hindsight, I realized that it was the reaffirmation of my existence in this universe. And trying to make sense of it, I asked my dad, why are you, you, and me, me? And you know, he was on his phone and he just looks at me and goes, huh? <laughs> why are you, you, and me, me? What do you mean, he says. I mean, what makes us different? How come I can realize what's happening in my own body, but I can't realize what's happening in your body? And then he said, well, because we have different bodies. Well, what makes us so different? And then he went on and explained about how we are made out of different atoms and energies, which led us to talk about the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe and time itself, and how there's so much we don't know yet. So I went to bed that night, being so frustrated by the fact that we barely knew anything, because, you know, as a kid, you have this expectation that adults are the most divine, intelligent beings in the whole universe. But that's not the case at all. <laughs> so I made a vow to myself. I said, I will find out everything by myself. And by the time I die, I would have found out all the answers in the world. Pretty naive, but I was seven, so. <laughs> so who here has been asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, it's a pretty generic question. Well, from the age of three, I always said, a scientist, without knowing what science actually was. And one day, I don't remember this, but my grandmother asked me, well, why do you want to be a scientist? And I answered, because they get to sit in the air conditioning all day. <laughs> anyway, back to the point, all I knew was that they asked questions and answered them. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. So fast forward to when I had to think about my green stone, I looked at the sustainability compass. And the first question that popped in my mind was, how can I use science to help solve one of the world's worst environmental problems? And coincidentally enough, a scientist, Miranda Wong, came to green school not too long after. And she proposed that we go to the dump site here in Sarangan, and she wanted to find some samples that could potentially bring us one step closer to solving the world's plastic pollution problem. So I thought, wow, great. So using her work as inspiration, I narrowed down my question to, how can I use science to solve the world's plastic pollution problem? So we went to the dump site, as you can see, and we can see all of these cute cows ignoring the fact that they're laying in piles of trash. And they were digging through the trash and eating plastic along with it. But they're happy and healthy and they're producing healthy offspring. So we were questioning a bit about that. Now, who here eats meat? I know there aren't a lot of us here, but I do. Now, imagine if your fancy grass-fed Angus cattle ate plastic. It'd get sick and die off pretty quickly. So imagine if we ate plastic. We'd all be dead by now. So how come these cows are able to eat plastic every day, but we can't? To answer this question, I have to explain a little bit about how cows digest their food. Now, animals like cow eat hay and grass. These plants are rich in cellulose, which is a type of carbohydrate. 
and they rely on bacteria and organisms in their digestive tract to help break it down for them into forms in which they can extract nutrients from. And these bacteria produces enzymes, which are basically protein molecules that help speed up chemical reactions, helping us break down organic compounds, such as cellulose. And it's believed that the cows here in Sarangan, they've evolved this bacteria in their digestive tract to not only be able to break down cellulose, but plastics as well. Now that's something worth looking at. And plastics take around 10 to 1,000 years to biodegrade. And I'll spare you the nitty gritty details of the chemistry, but what's important to know is that plastics are made out of extremely strong carbon-carbon bonds. Nature doesn't make anything like this. The organisms that are, for example, responsible for decomposing organic matter don't know how to break down plastic. The organisms that turn your bananas brown after you leave them out have evolved over billions of years to attack certain types of bonds commonly found in nature. And again, plastic isn't one of them. And it wasn't until recent years that researchers have looked to microorganisms to look at their potential in breaking down plastics. <coughs> And just last year, researchers in Kyoto found this worm that produced an enzyme that could break down PET, a type of plastic found in plastic bottles. And it took the enzyme six weeks, whereas it would have taken it 450 plus years to biodegrade in nature. So using their research as inspiration and Miranda's research as inspiration, I decided to do some further research on my own. Sorry, I'm a bit sick. Can I drink some water? This is awkward. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So a basic rundown of my research was that I'd go to the dump site, <clears throat> I'd collect plastic samples as well as cow feces, and then I'd isolate and culture these samples onto some Petri dishes. <coughs> Sorry. And then I would have these different test tubes with different types of plastic, and I'd swab these and put it in some solution with the different types of plastics. And how I determined whether or not the bacteria was breaking down the plastics was if they were growing in the tubes, meaning they were using the plastics as their sole food source. Now, I only recently did the whole procedure, so I'm still waiting on some data. So, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so, what does it even mean to have found a bacterial species that can biodegrade plastics? Well, in theory, the bacteria would break down the plastics, use it as energy, and a product would be organic chemicals. And we can use these chemicals to create fresh, new, virgin plastics, as manufacturers call it. So you know in Bali how people collect plastic bottles and cans at the beaches? That's because there's a market value. People bring it back to the recycling station and then they get money in turn. But you don't see them picking up plastic bags and straws. That's because there is no value to it, yet. I mean, here at Green School, we're all aware of the adversity that comes with plastic pollution. National Geographic recently did a study and said that 100 million sea animals each year are killed by plastic debris in the oceans. Now that's a staggering number. And us humans, as a society, we won't stop using plastic bags, or plastic in general, just yet. We buy plastic products, we use it, we throw it away, it ends up in the environment. This happens over and over again. And this follows a linear economy. We won't stop using plastics until something better comes along. We have to think about this realistically. You go to Pepito, almost everything is packaged in plastic. Your laptops, your iPhones, all contain plastic. And the majority of us aren't ready to give it up all just yet. So imagine a world where used plastic has a value, creating a circular economy. This, the bacteria can be the beginning of a true recycling system for plastics, as people's mindsets will start to shift, they'll see plastic as items with value instead of just trash, because there'll be a recycling system set in place, thus creating a new economy for it. I know this might sound a bit weird, because here at Green School, we think plastic as such an evil thing, but if you think about it, we're the evil here. A gun isn't evil, it's the person holding the trigger. 
We're the ones throwing out plastic out into the environment. So if people's mindsets shift, and instead of just throwing it out and recycling it instead, plastic might not be such a bad thing. And we're not even going to be creating new, using new resources. We'll just be recycling from the old ones. Now, I'm not saying this is the end-all, be-all solution to it, but and it'll take several years of research, but turning over rocks and finding nothing is still progress. And the reason why I'm so inspired to do this research is because of curiosity. It's the reason why we know what we know. It's the foundation to the evolution of mankind, both mind and soul. Throughout my long 17 years of life, in my childhood, I've seen my friend's parents shut them down for asking questions any child would ask. And after so many years of being shut down, they've stopped asking questions. Their desire to learn is lost. And I'm not saying they're bad at school or anything, but that childlike curiosity that so many of our greatest thinkers had is now gone. And imagine a world where nobody asked questions. We'd all still be cavemen. And there are so many dimensions to curiosity, and the epistemic nature of it needs to be nurtured from the day we are born. So kids, ask your parents questions, no matter how big or small, just don't be afraid to ask. And parents, I ask you to nurture this curiosity, not just parents, teachers and adults, because it will encourage them to adapt this feeling beyond childhood and into adulthood. We humans are programmed with this amazing gift, as I said earlier. And if you were to take away one thing from my greenstone, I ask for you to make time for this gift. Because one of the most reliable and overlooked keys to happiness is cultivating and exercising our innate sense of curiosity. It creates an openness to unfamiliar experiences, laying the groundwork for greater opportunities to experience discovery, joy, and delight. As Einstein said, and you can't argue with Einstein, never stop asking questions. Curiosity has its own reasoning for existing. Thank you. Yeah!